Good day, my name is Bill Carr and welcome to another Aruba Networks Tech Tip. Today we're going to discuss using the Aruba Instant APs in what's referred to as RAP NG mode or actually also referred to as IAP VPN mode. Um, the Instant APs allow some really unique feature sets and let's talk about those in some detail. The Instant APs are very versatile. Uh, an Instant AP can run in Instant mode, which is controllerless, um, works very well in distributed branch offices, allows us to take and provide some autonomy at small, remote, to, mid, small to mid-sized remote sites. Um, they provide uh, localized networking um, and uh, provide survivability in the event the WAN or internet links are down. An Instant AP can also function in campus mode, um, which is what many of our uh, legacy Aruba customers would be familiar with, which is where a, a centralized Aruba controller provides uh, a GRE tunnel, and that GRE tunnel is used to bring the user traffic back to that centralized controller for inspection and controls. The Instant APs can also function as a traditional remote AP, where, similar to campus mode, they tunnel the user's traffic back to a centralized site, However, they do it over an IPsec tunnel, which provides the ability to use those same uh, APs at a remote location uh, over the Internet. Many of our customers have used the remote AP technology to uh, facilitate work-at-home environments um, with things such as IP telephones behind them and provide the same SSIDs and same wireless network connectivity for an end user working from home as they would in the office. The Instant APs with IAP VPN mode actually take and provide a hybrid model. So we get the best of both worlds. We actually get some advantages of, um, the, hybrid, of the campus AP and remote AP model. We also get some of the advantages of the Instant AP model. So let's look at those advantages. So some of those benefits are the Instant APs create a local virtualized controller and some site autonomy that localizes all of the ARM and RF protect functionality that runs at a local branch. It means that that takes place faster um, and is more focused on a particular site as opposed to being calculated for a number of sites back at a centralized location. For those who have done controller-based APs uh, over large campus environments, um, scaling those ARM um, decision processes can be a challenge where you have to create RF neighborhoods. So using an instant AP in this model actually kind of localizes all of that decision uh, uh, capabilities. We can leverage that survivability feature. Instant APs can function without a WAN or an internet. So I can provide access to local printers and local compute resources in the event of a WAN outage or a VPN outage. The overhead on the tunnel is much smaller because we're not actually sending all of that ARM calculation data across that, uh, that tunnel as well. There's also some uh, reduced licensing uh, requirements on the controller because we're actually only bringing back a single tunnel for a branch, regardless of the number of instant APs that may be at that branch. There's some disadvantages as well. Um, some of those disadvantages are because we're actually bringing the users into the IAP virtual controller, the users are only visible at the IAP level, and we're actually just creating an IPsec tunnel for traffic that's destined for the headquarters location. The controller doesn't manage IAPs that are in IAP mode because of design. They're really not designed to do that. You can convert an IAP to uh, either RAP or campus AP mode, and if it is, um, those would be visible and managed on the controller because we're bringing the RF data and the user data back. Um, if you're using IAPs in standalone IAP mode or in, with, in conjunction with IAP VPN, it's recommended that you look at uh, Aruba's Airwave or Central products uh, for managing those solutions. So to set up an IAP VPN, there's actually two sides of the connection. There's going to be the piece of the connection that exists in the IAPs at the branch location, and we have to also configure the controller to accept the IAP cluster. So the first step is we want to make sure that inbound UDP 4500 can come across the internet and reach our controller um, over the internet. And that would be to the externally facing controller IP. It's either going to be a public address that's NATed or a native public address. 
if you're currently using wraps, this should be done already. Um, so if you currently have remote APs uh, up and functioning, this step probably won't need to be done. The second step would be to make sure that we actually whitelist the AP and the controller. Um, the syntax for that has changed a bit. So if you're prior to 6.3, we use the local user DB uh, AP command to add the MAC address. Um, if you're past 6.3, uh, it's the whitelist DB command. One of the things you'll also note at the end is there is a thing called the AP group uh, as part of this command, which includes a string. Because we're really not terminating an AP on the end of this, uh, in, in the traditional sense of the word, it's an IAP cluster. It's just an, an I, uh, it's a VPN endpoint, but not necessarily functioning as a, re a remote AP or a campus AP. That string can be any value. It's not really an AP group. It's not used for configuration. All of your IAP config is done via the IAP itself or via Central or Airwave. Um, the CLI command that's been there for a while uh, for whitelisting does require this argument. So you can put any string in there you want. It doesn't even have to be an existing AP group. The third step would be to make sure that you have uh, an L2TP pool. Uh, and that could be for specifically for IAPs, or you could reuse the one that you're using for remote APs. Um, you just want to be uh, sure that you're not going to exceed the capacity of the pool that you create. So if you're going to have 20 remote APs and 20 IAP clusters, you would need 40 addresses in your pool. Just be aware of that. And then you want to make sure that your default VPN rule is mapped um, to, uh, to use that L2TP pool. And let's take a quick look at our controller. So this is a controller that uh, we're going to actually test our termination against, and that's the existing uh, wrap L2TP pool. Uh, it currently has 255 addresses in it, so we should have plenty of addresses to get ourselves up and running. The other things that we'll have to do is on the IAP side. We'll have to make sure that we connect to the IAP web user interface. Um, we'll have to define a VPN connection. And that VPN connection will walk through in just a few seconds. Um, the, the, there will be a gateway required when you define the VPN, and that will be your controller IP or DNS name. Um, you'll notice a couple stars on this configuration node here. Um, that VPN connection can also have a backup. So we'll talk in advanced topics about how we can handle uh, redundancy um, and how we, we handle making sure that those branches can survive a failure of a single controller. The third thing that we would have to do on our IAP cluster is create a DACP pool and map it to an ESSID. We'll walk through that process as well. And you'll see some stars there because in the advanced topics we'll talk, there's a number of uh, modes that we can handle DACP in to make DHCP either localized at the site, distributed at the site with some capabilities at the central site, or completely centralized. We'll talk about some of the pros and cons of those as well. And then the last step would be to connect the client to our, our new network and attempt to reach a, um, a resource that's across the VPN tunnel and validate that our, our VPN tunnel has come up. So let's go through those steps now. So now we've gone ahead and accessed our Aruba Instant uh, AP user interface, and we're going to build our VPN definition. So from this remote branch location, we're going to build an Aruba IPsec tunnel to a controller that lives back in our demo lab. Um, in this case, you'll notice we've used an IP address. It could be an IP address or a DNS name. We've also only entered the primary, because there's only a single controller there today. If we had multiple controllers, um, or multiple controllers in multiple data centers, we could configure the primary host and the backup host, and also the parameters by which we would fail over between the two. In our next step, we actually build the routing table, and that routing table is the definition of what interesting networks we want to have VPN traffic qualified for to go back to our, our headquarters or data center location. In this case, it's a slash 24, 192, 168, 100, and the gateway that we enter is the controller's IP address to get us to that network. In this case, it would be controller IP address or DNS name. The next step is for us to actually create a DHCP scope um, that we can then utilize for one of our SSIDs. So under our DHCP server settings, you'll notice that uh, we can do a default DHCP scope for things that are assigned by the virtual controller. We can also do distributed, centralized, and local DHCP scopes. We're going to build a local DHCP scope 
and towards the end of this discussion, we'll talk a little bit more about the different options for, for DHCP services. In this case, our local branch, we're going to uh, create a VLAN called VLAN 10, and we're going to place 192.168.2.1 as our DHCP scope um, for that location. And you can see here we can configure the name, the scope, the lease time, domain name, uh, DNS servers, uh, etc. And then we'll go ahead and finish that. The next thing we would do is actually um, configure an SSID to utilize that DHCP scope. So in this case, we have uh, an IAP VPN demo SSID. Uh, we have configured a custom VLAN assignment, which uses our branch 001 VLAN 10 definition. Uh, we've created a pre-shared key network, very simplistic, and we're going to allow uh, access with no restrictions. Uh, however, this could be role-based or network-based as well. Now it's time for us to start validating that this all works. I can actually tell you, because this particular workstation is actually on that SSID, and we can see it up here, this is the client on that SSID, uh, I did receive a local 201.207 address, and I can also reach resources back on my uh, 192.168.100 uh, network. Um, we can also verify from the controller side of that connection, uh, as you can see here, we can verify that we have our tunnel up, and this is the uh, L2TP address uh, connected to that device. So realistically, that's all there is to very simple IAP VPN setup. Let's talk about some details on how this can become a little more complex and how you can make this scale for your enterprise environment. So now we've had an opportunity to kind of look at a very simple IAP VPN cluster and how we can create a VPN tunnel between that IAP cluster at a remote branch office and a single controller at our centralized location. Let's talk about some options for how we handle giving clients addresses and what that means to our environments when we do that. So we can do uh, local scopes uh, in the IAP cluster. In that case, the virtual controller um, in a layer two mode provides both the DHCP function um, being the DHCP server and is the gateway for the local user. So a user connected to that subnet can use the, the DHCP uh, services from the IAP and then also uses the IAP cluster IP as its gateway. We can actually do DHCP forwarding mode uh, in local layer three as well. In this case, the virtual controller acts as a DHCP server and the gateway and assigns an IP address from the local subnet and then it routes all the packets sent by clients on the uplink. So that uplink can be um, cellular, it can be um, uh, Ethernet, it can be another Wi-Fi uplink, um, and that allows us to have some capabilities for flexibility across um, uplink capabilities. We can also do centralized scopes. Centralized scopes, the virtual controller doesn't assign any uh, IP addresses, and DHCP traffic is forwarded crossed to um, an actual existing DHCP server. So for centralized layer two clients, we simply bridge the traffic um, to the controller uh, over a VPN tunnel. So if your uh, DHCP server exists behind the controller, um, we, can, we can drop that uh, DHCP request out behind the controller. This also allows you to add the DHCP option 82, which is the SSID name. Um, and we can actually include that in the DHCP request and we can forward that to the controller. And the controller can then make forwarding decisions based on that. We can also do centralized layer three clients. In that case, we actually work just like a traditional DHCP relay agent. We forward DHCP uh, traffic to a DHCP server located either over the corporate network or on the local network. So if you want to, you can actually have a localized DHCP server for survivability. Um, and this is how we see a number of our installations uh, deployed with centralized layer three scopes. We can also do distributed scopes. Um, in a distributed scope, uh, the, the virtual controller acts as a DHCP server, but the gateway actually lives in the data center. So that, that kind of handles some of our traffic flow problems that we have for some customers who uh, want to make sure that all the traffic is inspected at a centralized site. We can also do distributed um, layer three. In this case, um, consider the IAP cluster like a small router with a built-in DHCP server, and we have kind of everything distributed at that, that site. Um, 
And then based on the number of clients for each branch, the range of addresses is divided across them. So in that case, we have a large scope and we distribute it based on the number of clients at each site. The other concern when we talk about scaling is how do we handle uh, tunnel survivability? So if I am going to put um, IAPs at a remote branch and I have a centralized controller in the data center, I may also want to have a capabilities to recover in the event that controller goes down or that data center is unreachable. So a pair of controllers can be used, um, can be more than a pair if we do um, either some fancy load balancing or some great DNS name um, uh, controls. And then we can use those to populate the primary and backup uh, VPN endpoints. So one of the things that we have to then consider is if we're doing a distributed um, network, and I have a branch uh, network that comes in on controller one and controller one disappears, I can't route traffic to get to that branch back to controller one anymore because most likely the VPN endpoint has failed to the backup on controller two. So in those environments, generally we leverage uh, OSPF route injection and we actually uh, export the routes um, and redistribute them into OSPF so that in the event a branch moves from the primary controller to the backup controller, um, the rest of your enterprise network is fully aware of how to reach that branch location now that it's moved to another VPN endpoint. Uh, it also creates some great scalability uh, and some great mechanisms for doing primary, secondary, tertiary backups as well. So hopefully that was very uh, useful for those who have never seen or touched an IAP VPN. Again, this was meant to be a very cursory introduction because um, we try to keep these short. Um, there are some references here that we've utilized. Um, many of them come directly from the community website. Uh, some come from the Aruba uh, technical notes on instant uh, IAP VPN configuration and DHCP configuration. Uh, if there are any questions or if you'd like more details on how an IAP VPN environment can help your distributed locations, make sure you give us a call at ComSolutions um, or email your local account representative or the email address you see here. Thanks for viewing.